morning, everybody. I hope you had a good day yesterday and a good day today. Thanks for having me here again. So today we're going to talk about Scala and how we, as in my team, has gotten into it. So this is um, me. Hi, everybody. I'm Martin. I'm from Zurich in Switzerland. Beautiful city. You should definitely check it out. I know the Euro versus Francs course is not too bad. The exchange rate is, is not too good either. Um, definitely have a, have a go at it. I work at a definitely recommended. You have mountains, you have a lake, you have a river. Uh -huh. um, so I work at a company called Archaeologic. And whenever someone asks me for what are you doing, then I'm saying, that is a good question. I do whatever needs to be done. So um, I don't like the term full stack because I'm never going to do kernel hacking again. Um, but I kind of do not live on just the front end or just the back end. I just go where a problem is, and I try to help my team solve it. A brilliant team there, and we are hiring. So if you want to write some Scala for a living, let me know. Um, I'm also on Twitter. And uh, with this, without further ado, let's go into what we're going to discuss. Basically, this talk has three sections. One is, how did we end up, or why, why, why did we want to switch our current stack, or our original stack, which was entirely based on Node.js, uh, for something else? And how did it end up being Scala? And what makes Scala nice and easy? So basically, it's a quick introduction into Scala, primarily. So first of all, <sighs> We thought about you know, getting something else, because you need a change every now and then. right? You don't go to the same restaurant, have the same dish every day. If you do, also cool, but I'd like some change. And most people felt like it. So we decided to go for Scala, which is a really nice pizzeria and restaurant in Zurich. Um, first of all, it actually is cheaper than the one that we have been usually to. Um, second of all, and this is really important, it has a better crust on the pizzas. And actually, the pasta sauce is really good as well. And also, the large variety of toppings that you can freely combine is really, really nice. Because in the other restaurant, you had these five to 10 different pizzas that you then just you know, chose from. And after a couple of days, you're like, ah, oh, really? What am I going to do? And now we can actually freely combine different toppings so that you get the pizza that you actually want. Wait a minute. Oh, the other Scala. All right, fine, fine. OK, OK, never mind. Uh, oh, t technical topic. Um, I'm a bit hungry, so it's really hard to actually stay on topic. So first of all, we figured out that um, changing our infrastructure a bit, we ran into fields where we had to deal with uh, a few existing, or we could either rebuild a very, very complicated set of tools or use Java dependencies. Well, you can do that with Node.js. You can use Nashorn, for instance, to actually get Node.js onto the JVM, or you use a framework uh, like Vertex, which is polyglot, so you can have components in different languages and then integrate them using an event bus, but that's turned out to be very shaky, actually. Um, or you just use a, a language like, well, Scala, or anything else that runs on the JVM. And then we figured, actually, you know what? The JVM is actually pretty much a power horse, so that's kind of convenient. So it's not too bad to actually use a tool that relies on this stable foundation that is the JVM. The other thing that we found is, by growing our infrastructure, we had to have the choice, or we, we had the choice to either have one monolithic thing that grows up really, really much, and it was already getting a bit hairy. Um, it came out of a prototyping stage, really. So we decided, well, we're going to split it up into services. And the early efforts of that showed that a lot of times you actually saw type issues where there shouldn't have been any, because you have a large library and, and different people work on different uh, components and use things slightly different. And then you ended up with like having to look up the, the documentation or the original implementation to figure out how this actually works and what it could return. And then you still got some surprises every now and then. That's just, if you ever saw the undefined is not a function problem, then here, yeah, well, you get that on the back end, doesn't really have to be, right? So we would like to have some type safety, but then again, a lot of our team members perceived, and that's the reaction that I keep getting when I, when I say, hey, I'm going to talk about Scala. Like yesterday uh, evening, I talked like, so what are you going to be talking about tomorrow? I'm like, well, Scala. And they're like, oh, yeah, uh, types. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, type system is there to help you, which doesn't mean that it's perfect or a silver bullet to solve all your problems. 
but if your system grows to a certain size, they actually come in pretty handily because they avoid entire classes of errors that just happen because you're a larger distributed team and people write things slightly different and you can do all sorts of, of coding guidelines. People are people, right? We are humans, we are not computers. So people make mistakes. So I would like to have a system that helps people avoid mistakes or catch mistakes even before they check in their code into our source control. So on the other hand, sometimes you have to deal with a bit of, or you want a bit of flexibility, right? And when you ever saw someone going like, okay, I have this polymorphism and I have 10,000 variations of the same function that do more or less the same thing, or convert and cast between types, it's just annoying and it just gets in the way. And that's where type systems then become part of the problem rather than the solution. So we'd like something that actually is a bit, gives us a bit leeway and convenient and elegant leeway where we can say, all right, okay, types could nice and fine, but here in this particular case, we have various different implementations or various different data types that we want to deal in one place with because it's only changing small details in the flow. And obviously having a bunch of tooling that Java brings in is also quite nice, like Visual VM where you can easily um, inspect the memory consumption uh, and, and garbage collection of running applications in vitro. Um, all sorts of other profiling tools, testing tools, um, Sonar Source, or now wait a minute, it's called differently now, Cube, um, all sorts of that kind of stuff, Artifactory, JAR deployments, really, really nice. So we'd like to have that as well. And um, why Scala? Well, we could have gone with Java or Clojure or so many others. But we decided, and that's actually quite fun. I was at a friend's place at some point, and he had Risk the board game, and a board game called Java, and I'm like, this combination, so feel free to take a picture right here. Um, so the thing is, switching entirely over to Java is a risk because it is a very, very different system, it's a very different uh, execution environment from what Node.js gives you, and it, even with Java 8 being now stable and ready, and having lambdas, we'd like a bit more functional approach. But then again, we also have parts of our code where object-oriented programming just makes more sense. So we'd like something that allows us to do something that isn't Java, right? Like heavy functional programming or just not very type-safe programming in certain areas. Um, and then again, we also want to work with Java dependencies without having to sort of write wrappers around them or sort of have to deal with weird stuff. And Scala is nice because Scala is actually, at the very basic, a Java drop-in replacement. So you don't have to deal with any weird stuff. If it's a Java library, you can just write Java and then use Scala to compile that, and that's kind of fine as well. Or you actually then go and write some Scala, but it still import your uh, Java dependencies just as it would be Java to begin with. So that's kind of nice. So Scala, as I said, gives us the fact that it runs on the JVM, which is something that we'd like. It has all the Java tooling because it is, in fact, just basically a Java drop-in replacement. It is fully compatible with everything that Java can do, so you don't have to worry. You can just write Java and pretend that you're writing Scala. Fine by me. Um, and the cool thing is it also has a REPL. And that's something that a lot of people keep saying. And I, actually, that was my first reaction was like, yeah, but it's, it's cool and nice and fine, but what if I want to do some scripting? Or what if I just want to try out some code on, as I go along? And um, turns out, let me quickly change the profile so that you can actually, can you read this? OK, good. So let's talk about Scala. Wow, right? That was reasonably fast. I have seen Ruby versions that load slower than this. And you can just like straight away start and say things like, uh, and then you go like, hey, that looks a bit like JavaScript. And it also has cool things like string substitution. And I can just run that straight from my, my terminal. And I can even use it in shell scripts if I ever wished to do so. Um, no, wait a minute. I keep getting that one wrong. So that is pretty cool. We have a REPL that we can quickly try. We have a bunch of tooling that actually reloads the code as I, as I program. So uh, there's a tool called SBT, which is the Scala build tool, 
that allows you to have a small plugin that recompiles just the classes that you actually changed, and it figures out dependencies. So it just compiles the bits and pieces that you actually change very quickly, and then you can just run your tests or, or uh, scripts. And that's really handy as you develop. Um, it's a bit like JRebel, if you have ever heard or used that. And actually, it's, the syntax is relatively simple. It looks a bit weird at first, and you can make it very complicated, but the same is true for Ruby. Some Ruby code looks like a cat has walked over a keyboard. You can do that with Scala, but you don't have to. And uh, it's actually, if you, if you have ever, who here has ever written Java? Hands up. Some brave people. So you know that sometimes it's just very annoying because you have to write fuck tons of lines, and that's actually not a swear word, that's a technical term, as long as it's a metric factor. Um, so the metric fuck tons of lines you have to write is a bit annoying, and you don't have to really write that many lines to get stuff done in Scala, which is handy. And the, the type system is incredibly flexible, and we're going to see that in a second. And obviously, you get simple deployments using war files or jar files, and you just drop that onto a machine that has the, J, uh, uh, JDK, uh, sorry, the JRE installed, and then you can just run it on the machine that you're on. So not like Node.js deployments usually. I, I once had a project uh, at a former, former, former company that I worked for where a team that I was dropped into managed to have, so it's like, so how do I deploy your Node.js application? Oh, OK, so you install Node.js, all right. Then you install Make and GCC. Yeah, sure, there's C extensions in there. A few libraries, all right. Perl, wait, what? And Python. What? Wait, whoa, what? Why? Oh, yeah, well, you know, we use this one script that's actually only available as a P Perl script that's used by our Gulp or Grunt back at the time, Grunt uh, uh, job, and we can't really change that now because we don't have time for that. And then we use this other thing that minifies something something into something else, and that's actually using Python, and it uses this and this library. It's like, holy moly, what the hell? So that gets very, very hairy very quickly. Here you just drop the, you make sure that it has the system you're going to go to has Java, and you drop the jar file, and that's it. So that's pretty convenient. Right. So. I love that you have here, Talon has this brilliant building that says Scala City. I just, I wanted to take a picture, but the buzz was too quick for me, so I downloaded this from Wikipedia. Thanks, Wikipedia. Um, so, type system. The first reaction I get when I say Scala, from, especially from JavaScript developers, is, ugh, typing? Like, really? And the cool thing is, if you don't want to do it, then just, you know, let, Scala figure it out for you, and in most cases, that's perfectly fine. Mm. It's not a complete, holy moly, super awesome type inference, but for most, re for most kinds of things, it actually works. So I can just say, I have a value sum, and I just use some numbers, and then I get probably what's an integer, really. Or I can just have a list and just throw in random stuff, and it's going to go, OK, yeah, that's a list of strings. Nice. And I don't have to specify that, really. Uh, and also, I don't have to do weird stuff to actually construct a list. I just go like, it's a list of this. That's it. And I have a list. I can obviously also explicitly state that I want a value to be of a certain type. And that can be handy as well. And Java style, like if you remember classes in Java, it has been uh, really annoying, really, because you have these you have to say like annotations for certain things, and then you have to have your uh, access rights explicitly uh, stated, and, and lots of getters and setters. And uh, don't worry, just use this syntax, and that's all you need. So I can then say Martin equals person, and then just throw in my name and my age, and then I'm done. And you have inheritance, you have multiple inheritances here, and that's pretty much it. And you can, you can also specify parameters in the constructor. So it's not really that much of a deal. Then there's also a more realistic example where we also have a private member. I can specify that H, for instance, is private. And then I want a getter and a setter. Well, I just say like H, if I go this person dot H, I'm going to get the H, which is the private um, variable here. I might also specify a setter. So I say if I go H underscore, I can, could call it set H as well. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's a function that or a method, sorry, that takes the new age as an integer and actually uh, updates the private, um, the private member. 
And then there's also case classes, which makes it even easier if your class does not have any state or any internal mechanics and just has to hold data. JSON, for instance, is basically just a piece that holds data. It doesn't have any state or methods or something like that. So then you can use a case class, which is a bit simpler and easier to instantiate because I can just go like, yeah, here, that's it. I don't even have to define a constructor and I, can, I don't even have to say what I have because it's, it's defined in this one line and then I'm done with that. So that's pretty handy for classes as you go along. Most useful for arithmetic data types. Um, you also have immutability built in, but you don't have to use it. It's not like on by default. It's a good choice to go Im immutable as much as you can. And then you just go val for value. If you try to reassign that, oh boy, that's not going to fly. Um, the compiler will shout at you and hit you on your fingers. This one, you can easily change, whatever. Um, the default structures for collections, lists, hash maps, sets, all that kind of stuff, is immutable. There's also um, the same equivalent of all these classes as mutable, but by default, you should use uh, immutable there. So it tries to enforce it, but it doesn't really get into your way if you ever decide, no, actually, no, I can't be bothered. Nice. And you, it, everything is an object, really and everything returns something. So you can easily just go like 42.toString and then put it together with another string and that's it. Um, you can also basically write this, or this is what you should be theoretically writing, but Scala does that more or less for you. And actually you can leave out the dot as well. So you can just go like 42.toString and it's gonna do the rest for you. Unless it's unclear how things get together, then obviously you have to specify the so for instance, leaving out the dot and the two-string uh, um, parentheses here. The parentheses would be fine, but the two-string, it wouldn't know that it actually binds to this one, so you would have to specify 42.2-string plus is the answer to get a string. You can also do aspect-oriented programming. So instead of having to have uh, a bunch of interfaces, um, you can also allow an implementation straight away but you don't have to have a, a complete different class, you can just have traits. So for instance, this trait vehicle here specifies that it's gonna have a speed and uh, it has some start method that can be overridden by anything else and it overrides the, the default if nothing's given. And um, you also have objects that you can use, for instance, for singletons. So you just define an object here. Whoops, where's my base pointer? In this case, a fox. And then you can say this object shall have a say method. And then you can just say fox say. So you don't have to instantiate this. It's a singleton instance for you immediately. Right. You can obviously also do functional programming, which is really nice. And it looks a bit like if you looked at ES6, um, it looks a bit like the ES6 syntax. So you specify your, your signature and the return value and then you can just call it. I could call it without the parent anyways. But the cool thing is functions are definitely first class citizens, citizens and they are higher, or there's the possibility to have higher order functions. So for instance, the map function, uh, the map method on lists um, can directly call any function. Or I could even do an anonymous uh, function here and just have this part inside this one and it would still work. And uh, you can shorten that a bit. So for instance, here we are having a single input that just gets modified in a certain way. So we can just say like underscore because I don't actually don't care how it's named and I'm just gonna modify it straight away. So that's working as well. It's a bit shorter. Um, and they, as I said, they are first class citizens. So here this function call specifies that I'm gonna call it with an integer value and a function that modifies this. And it actually what it really does, the implementation of this function is, it calls the function that I passed in with a value. That's not very clever and not very useful, but it's a simple example, I think. So here I can call um, the function with a value three and specify the function itself to be taking three and just square it straight away. So that works as well. We also uh, have pattern matching and options and futures. I'm not covering futures here, but asynchronous operations are more or less if you are, who here has or is a JavaScript developer? Good. So 
you might already know that promises, ES6 promises are the big thing. ES7 comes, or ES2016, as it will hopefully be called, uh, comes with a nicer syntax for wrapping, uh, the await syntax for wrapping these, these promises. Um, Scala just calls them futures. It's the exact same thing. So basically, I can say this, this thing here will at some point return something, and then it's a future. Um, options are also really helpful because, for instance, if my future actually does an HTTP call, what the hell do I do if it doesn't return the result that I want? And not, it's not an exception, right? It might not be an exception. It might just go like, I don't know. There's no data here. It, it works, but there's no data here. Handling that as, a, as an exception in Java always felt wrong to me because it is not an exception. If I have a thing that asks me for like, are there any new emails? And it goes, there's no email. Then why would I call that an exception? And why would I, would I waste it on the, or waste, waste work on the back end to actually sort of construct saying like, yeah, there's an empty email object. No, that's bullshit. There is no email. That's it. Thanks, done. Here you do it with uh, options. So for instance, this might ask for uh, the pet of a person. And it, maybe it does an API request, and the API, API might respond with uh, nah. And um, then I can say, OK, this, this pet, my pet, is an option. So it might or might not be a pet. And then I can ask if I want to figure out if I actually have a pet. It's a brilliant thing, isn't it? It's like Schrodinger's uh, function call. Um, you don't know what you're going to get until you actually call it. So, and then you can ask, like, is my pet, what, 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 the, what is this thing, right? What is it? So is it, is it some pet? Is it a pet? Nice. In which case, I can ask for the pet's name, for instance. Oh, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's not a pet. Well, OK, fine. In that case, no pet here. Move along. So we have that covered as well. And no exception handling here, because it's not an exception. I just don't have a pet right now. That's fine. Um, and then you can use the same syntax, the same match thing, to sort of go duck typing, where you go like, I don't care. Right? So in this case, this function, what is, doesn't care what you throw at it. It just has the thing, which can be anything, really. And then we ask, like, so what is this thing, then? Is it an int? Yeah, it's an int. Nice. Is it a string? Well, then it's a string. Is it Superman? No, it's an airplane. Um, if it's anything else, I have no idea what it is. It's a bit simplistic, but hey, that's, that's kind of handy, because I can just specify any function here that then does something and returns that. So that's pretty handy as well. But what if? So duck typing nice and fine, but sometimes I just want to assume that I have a th certain thing. And that's where JavaScript developers then go, um, this function gets a thing, and then it's like, if thing.method, then do stuff. Or if the thing does not have this method, then just you know, return immediately. Uh, we don't have to worry about that one. So for compile time, we get some support by structural typing. And what does structural typing mean? Well, I, I specify that the function make it sing takes anything that has a sing method that returns a string. So I can throw in anything here as long as it uh, um, actually fulfills this criteria, saying it has to have a dot sing method that returns a string. I don't care about the rest. You make up your own random classes, fine. But please, please, please give me at least a sing method. And then I have two classes. Bird and, and choir, and then I can ask, like, make it sing, new bird and new, cho new, new choir, and then, well, that, that'll work. If I would now go, like, make it sing string, that would not work, because string does not have the method sing. So it gives us type safety even when you don't really care about that much what the type really is, but just the capabilities. So this is sort of looking at what the thing that I'm getting can do, rather than saying, no, 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 it has to be this thing which sometimes is bullshit, right? And it has something that also has only recently come, came to uh, JavaScript, which is destructuring. So here I have a list of one to three. And if I want to get three values out of that, like distinct variables that I can work with, I just say, OK, so my values, first, second, and third, are a list made from this list. Oops, uh, sorry, list. So then I can print first, second, third, which will print one, two, three. So that is pretty handy. And you can actually also have uh, rests here. So if I just would go first and then underscore, then I would or um, first rest or something like that, it would probably go 
uh, one for first, and the second would be two, three. OK, fine. You also have uh, default params and named params. I'm going to cover these in a single example, actually. So this function foobar, brilliantly named. You're laughing, maybe, but actually I, I saw a project where there was a function called foobar. Uh, with the exact syntax, uh, not actually the exact syntax because it wasn't Scala, but it was brilliant. And it did some, some actually pretty clever stuff, but it used network I.O., so it was ex incredibly expensive. And I'm like, you named the one really expensive thing in your code that's actually very well hidden a horrific name to figure out what the hell it does. Brilliant. Good job, everybody. Um, I screwed up as well. I, had a, I once actually wrote a function that was uh, speakingly called G which was not very good and had parameters A and B. Um, so I, I am the first to, to blame when that happens on, on a team, but OK. <laughs> In this particular case, it wasn't me. Um, so it takes a string and another string, and they are called foo and bar, and they have default values. So I can just call foo bar, and it's going to say foo bar. Nice. Or I can just specify which parameter I actually want to address. So I can use the second parameter in the first place because I just rely on this uh, default parameter to be there, and then I say I want to set bar explicitly to buzz, so it's going to return foo buzz. Sweet. So that's, that's a feature that I was missing in oh so many languages, and this one luckily has it. And it has so much more, and my time is about to come to an end. So a few things that I want to point out. It has lazy evaluation. If you have ever written uh, Haskell, lazy evaluation is really handy. Um, so that means it only evaluates a statement when it's actually being used. Uh, it has a, a bunch of collection types and tuples, and we have seen case classes already. You can use annotations as well. Um, there has been a talk about Scala and Akka, uh, Akka being a actors framework, so it has actors and supports actors. It has generics, it has templating, it has uh, partial functions occurring and list comprehensions and for comprehensions, and it has so much more that's really, really handy and making it really nice to work with. Uh, there's a bunch of libraries already out there that help you with all sorts of stuff, be it configuration uh, formats, be it JSON parsing, be it uh, there's the, if you're coming from the JS world and wonder if how you can easily or as, as easy as possible be, um, rewrite your Express application, then that's, there's, a, there's a library called Undertow, which basically looks the same because you have a bunch of middlewares that you chain for each path, and middleware being a function. So that's, that's nice. And you have all the Java libraries. And there's, again, a metric factor of those. So that's really, really nice. And you have all the tooling available. And it's, it's <coughs> neat. And it's reasonably fast as well. So syntax is not that much of a problem. Nice. We got a REPL, so you can quickly try it out. Just download the, the, um, the, the Scala uh, compiler and um, implementation and just use it from your terminal. Do object-oriented programming or functional programming or both, whatever fits your use case. And you can use the type or leverage the type system <coughs> or not. You can work without it or use it where it makes sense or use it in a way that makes sense. So that's pretty convenient. And you're standing on the giant JVM, which makes it portable and actually reasonably well maintainable. And with that, I like to say thanks. Slides are online already. Um, ping me on Twitter if you have any questions, or ping me after, after the session if you have any questions. Thanks a lot for your time. I hope it was entertaining and useful. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, no, actually, I finished 10 minutes early. Can, is, is that possible? Whoops. Oh, boy. I, for some reason, thought I, my time is over now. All right. Well, any questions? We have 10 minutes for questions. Whoops. Yes. What the f Sorry, one second. Browsers be like, nope. Uh, yes. Aha. So what about the bad stuff? Um, so <laughs> the bad stuff is that um, the JVM, if you have never really worked with the JVM or have no operational experience with the JVM, there's a couple of defaults, like the memory defaults. Java is famous for consuming all the memory that it can get hold of. Um, that is not only half the truth. You can actually fix that by setting proper flags and actually make it 
smaller and more reasonable in memory usage. But if you don't know about that, then it's, it's something that you're going to hit your head hard uh, on. Another thing is a lot of the uh, many libraries that, that there are um, for Scala actually focus on, so there's, there's a, a play framework. So who here has, been, has heard or used play framework beforehand? So play framework is a pretty popular framework in the Java world because it tries to be sort of like hipsterish, like Rails, uh, Ruby on Rails or something. But it's a pretty large thing as well. It's pretty cool, but it's pretty large and not really suitable for all use cases. But a lot of the Scala libraries, for some reason, actually not, not for some reason, because it is so popular, basically only document how to use it with, with uh, play. And then if you're like, no, I'm not going to drag this large pile of stuff into my small project, so how do I use your library with it? There's not, no one talking about that. You have to figure that one out yourself, which is a bit of a, of a shame. The same goes for, for Akka. Akka, this actor-based framework, also from, actually, Akka, I think, is from TypeSafe, which is the company behind Scala. Um, so libraries either are bound or documentation tells you how to use things with Play or Akka. And if you don't use any of the two, then you're mostly in, in the open, like, Hello, how do I use a library, 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 install play, 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 but I don't want to play, 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 your problem, problem. Uh -huh. That's how we communicate in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a bit of a shame in my opinion. A lot of documentation generally is pretty raw and pretty bad, so that's not very good. And the other thing is that immutability and a very strong type system will cause beginners to have a bit of a hard time sometimes to figure out how things actually... Like, for instance, pattern matching. I have used pattern matching ages ago in some other language that I forgot about small talk. Anyways, um, if you have never done that, a lot of, of people coming to Scala are getting a bit confused, and you then have to wheeled through the large amount of documentation. So Scala itself is really well documented. However, it is so much documentation that it's not necessarily easy to navigate. I uh, highly recommend the Scala koans to sort of get into it interactively, step by step. Join a local Scala meetup if there is one for your region, because they, these people are usually really, really helpful. But a lot of the documentation of the libraries relies on you knowing a lot about the intern, uh, internal things of the type system or rely on meta programming of the type system, which doesn't make it easy for beginners to get into. But you can, trust me, you can make it. Just don't jump ahead. Because that's what I, what I usually do when I, I learn language. I learn how the soda works. And then I go into the really advanced things because I want to tweak things. And I did that with Scala. And I'm like, oh god, oh god, oh god. Oh god, all these very clever people, and then there's me, the dumb bass, going like, what? Um, so a coworker of mine is a Scala guru, also named Martin, funnily enough. Brilliant, brilliant person. And uh, I asked him a question that I thought was really simple, and very, very quickly, we were into class theory and, and system theory, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Very interesting but how the fuck do I write this down? Uh, and then he showed it to me, and obviously it was two lines. I'm like, actually, that makes sense. Why am I so stupid? So you will possibly feel stupid at the beginning, but don't worry, it's going to get better. I'm into Scala for uh, a year now, and I'm actually feeling quite proficient. And then I see codes of the gurus, and I go like, oh, wow, that's still a lot to learn. Um, but it's, it's really cool. And the cool thing is you don't have to use it. You don't have to use all the magic that's behind it. You can just use the simple Scala features. And if these confuse you, you just fall back to writing Java. I wouldn't do that. But hey, if, you if it helps you, then no judging, right? So a couple of years ago, when I first tried to look at Scala, uh, from Java, when I tried to some uh, source code of a really small project, uh, read a very little about physics. <laughs> some, some, some underscores and the columns to what? Yeah. <laughs> Java, when, I, when I first uh, looked at Java some, some 10, 15 years ago, it was class something, mm -hmm. method something. Yeah, this is true. You see the source code, uh, these objects, called these methods. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's clear. It's very speaks. That is true. Ha yeah. It's, so have you ever read Ruby code from people who consider themselves Ruby gurus? No. Lucky you. Because they, it, it, it's, so, so Scala has a lot of these shorthands where you can go like, actually, I don't care what the name of this is, or I actually don't even care what the value of this is, so I just have to consume it somehow, so let's use underscore, fuck that shit. Um, but you don't have to do that, but a lot of people do, because at some point you're get, just getting tired of writing the long form, so like, yeah, whatever. Nah. For instance, uh, for comparison, uh, comprehension, so when you try to consume a list and map that, you can do very clever things with folding and stuff and zipping them and sort of mapping them and flat mapping them, and the code looks for, for someone who just comes to it and doesn't actually know much about Scala, you're, you're looking at it like, what? Um, but then what you can do is you basically fire up the repo and try it step by step. This is literally what I have done. Like, what are these five freaking lines doing? Okay, I have a list of things, and then I fold them. Ah, yes, folding. Yes, I remember. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, so that, that's, then I get this. Okay, cool. And then I do this with it, and what the hell is that doing? Ah, so you can easily try it out. That's the, that's the advantage of having the REPL available. It's not that easy to read, I agree, uh, especially when you see code from experienced people uh, who just use all the Scala magic that there is, but you get into it, I guess. <laughs> then again, look at some magical dependency injection shit that's going on, on on some projects that use annotations to drag in random classes, and then you have an abstract proxy factory facade, and you're like, it's easy to read, but I have no freaking idea what's going on behind it. So there's that, right? So, right. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. SBT. SBT is a build tool. It builds my. Co it compiles my code. It gets my dependencies, I don't care about the rest. There's a few people who basically, it's a bit of a circle jerk, I have sometimes the feeling. Um, a lot of people really go off on it, like, oh yeah, so much better than everything else. Oh my god, it's the silver bullet. Be wary of these people, whatever they are. There's people going like, gulp, that's the thing of the world. It's the best build tool. No, it's not. Sorry, it's cool, but it's, it's not solving all your problems. Or, yeah, this is a build tool. Finally, we have a build tool for this uh, new language. So you re-implemented make. Um, so Scala build tool is cool, and it has a lot of powers and possibilities, and you can actually uh, move it into the direction that you want it to move, because basically you can, <laughs> pretty much you can meta-program your build file. So that, that is quite nice, and it basically, more or less, it gets compiled into a thing that actually con carries out your instructions. So it's really flexible. But honestly, I've seen build files that do that, and they look like, they, I don't know, they look like someone just got a character generator and just piped some random, random characters into a file, and magically it somehow compiles. I don't know. Maybe they actually used machine learning. They just piped random strings into a file and, saw, and, and checked if it compiles, and at some point it compiles, and they go like, yeah, um, which is cool. But on the other hand, it's very impractical. Um, so again, it's a Scala build tool can be really simple if you just use bits and pieces of it. It can be really complex if you need more power. So it's a power tool, but it doesn't force you into using all its power. Whereas, for instance, make is really just really, really simple and stupid, which is cool because the power comes from the parts that you plug into the make file. Whereas Scala build tool, basically, the power is in the build file. So th it's a different approach to things. And uh, I like SBT. I don't like when people do very clever things because I'm not a clever person, so I don't understand the clever things they do. And if I don't understand your make file, Oh, sorry, your, your build file, then it's your problem, not mine, is my opinion. Build files should be simple enough to, for people to understand. If it's not simple, if you need the power, then explain at least what you do. There is such a thing as comments. <laughs> FYI. Yeah, yeah, Scala has added that in the latest version. Um, <laughs> no, just uh, <laughs> for stupid people like me, no, I'm just kidding. So, yeah, um, SPT, powerful tool, I like it but I also like the other tools, and I use whatever the project really needs. 
And um, yeah, I, I like that it, it actually sort of does two jobs. It builds and it actually also manages your dependencies as well. So that's relatively simple. Actually, we can, can have a look at one of the simpler examples. Jesus, why can't I? Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. Don't let me exit the presentation mode. It's fine. I live. Fine. You know what? No, seriously, what is wrong with my browser? Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, I know what's wrong with my browser, and it's not, not convenient because actually Google Calendar is a dick. Um, it has these notifications that block every other browser window globally. So let me quickly check this out. Uh, so I, I once got bored and wrote a thing to test JSON RPC APIs because we're using JSON RPC. So this is my this is my build file. I hope it's I'm not sure. Can you read it? Some people say no, some people say yes. I love that response. So let's try to make it a little larger. It's readable now. All right. So here um, I define my, my dependencies, which is a sequence of things like I need a spray library. Uh, sorry, IO spray, spray can. Can uh, is a HTTP client, um, basic thingy. There's, it has a couple of other classes that I'm using. It has a JSON parser that I'm using. Bunch of dependencies for that. <laughs> I use Akka Actor because spray uses it. I'm sorry for that. If my colleagues see me, he's, he's really pissed on that everyone uses Akka, so I shh, don't tell him. Um, and I'm using the type safe config library, so that's my library dependencies. Um, I'm, as I'm asking, so it uses the default uh, Maven repositories, but I also ask it to use the Spray repository. Um, I define what my, my project is called, what's the class path for it, and the version and the Scala version this shall be compiled with, and it uses all the files from the current directory uh, that it's in, and it only evaluates that when the Scala build tool actually asks this, and this is my build file. Relatively simple. Um, I can do cra crazy stuff like that. I don't have an example right now, but yeah, um, I'm fine with this. If you don't, if you think this is overly complicated, use something else. Sorry, <laughs> no, no better answer. Uh, I don't think we have any more time for questions, and I think it's about f time for the next session. Thank you very much. Find me afterwards and talk to me.